Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. At a number of points in his work, All Things Are Possible, Lev Shestov is going to discuss what, what he views as the relationship between philosophy and what he's calling logic, which is covering a lot of grounds. He'll also talk about logical argumentation. He'll talk about the habit of logical thinking. He'll also talk about dialectics. And we also have to be careful. Philosophy's relation with logic is not something simple and straightforward, in part because philosophy itself is not something that you can just you know, give a definition of and now fully understand. I mean, that would be a very logical approach to it, but that would be part of the problem. And it's complicated a little bit further because philosophy oftentimes is missing its mark, according to Shesta. So he's engaging in philosophy. He's pointing out some models of how to do philosophy well. He's also explaining where philosophy became over-reliant on what he calls logic, or this, this broad sense, which includes, as I said, dialectics and logical argumentation. And so we, we have to you know, sort of piece together a composite picture. I think a good place to start is in um, part two, chapter nine, where he talks about a point of view. And here, he's not just talking about philosophers. He says, every writer, thinker, even every educated person thinks it necessary to have a permanent point of view. He climbs up some elevation, never climbs down again all his days. Whatever he sees from this point of view, he believes to be reality, truth, justice, good. And what he does not see, he excludes from existence. And so he's, he's, he's actually being a little bit hyperbolic there. Not every thinker is doing this. Obviously, there's some thinkers who are much more flexible, including himself, right? But this is a, a tendency. And what does it lead to? He goes on and he says, we have no wings and a winged thought is only a, a nice metaphor. Unless, of course, it refers to logical thinking. So this, this notion of the efficacy of logical thinking is already based on something like a metaphor. And he says, he who really wishes to know something and not merely to have a philosophy, a philosophy in the sense of having like some sort of orientation, some sort of system. So somebody who's not just doing that does not rely on logic and is not allured by reason. He must clamber from summit to summit and if necessary, hibernate in the dales. So he says, um, you have to be willing to engage in a certain kind of empiricism, you might call it. And an empiricism that goes beyond that of the empiricists who themselves are all too rationalist and, and uh, all too you know, devoted to logic. So something that would be like what William James calls a radical empiricism, right? So this is a good starting point. Another one, I think, is his, um, we could call it a denigration of logic. He's, or it's also a caution as well. And he's talking about, again, what goes into good thinking and good writing. And he tells us, this is in uh, book, uh, part one, chapter 14, what is the task of, of a writer? To go forward and share his impressions with his reader. He's not obliged to prove everything. Again, the experiential, the empirical side of things. Uh, you might also say a certain sort of partiality and particularity as well. So here he, he actually calls logic along with morality and science, those police agents, right? And what do we mean by that? Well, 
At the time that, that Shestov is writing, particularly as a Russian writer, the police agents are the ones who are not just, you know, the cop on the corner. They're the ones carrying out investigations and throwing people into jails and interrogating them and making sure that, that things stay nice and calm and that things go on as usual. So morality, science, logic, he says. And so the writer needs to have some sort of argument with which to frustrate them. So... You can't just say, I don't believe in you at all. Instead, you have to have some sort of, some sort of thing to give them. And here he says something that might appear rather cynical. I think I find it comical instead. He says, there's no necessity to trouble too deeply about the quality of the argumentation. Why fret about being inwardly right? It's quite enough if the reasoning which comes handiest will succeed in occupying those guardians of the verbal highways whose intention it is to obstruct his passage. So part of our engaging in, in writing in general or expressing ourselves in a coherent way, which could include philosophy, is like throwing bones to logic and science and morality so they can occupy themselves with that and then we can get on with the real business over here undisturbed and maybe even a, a real dialogue or conversation. <clears throat> so this is a great lead in to his discussions that arise at, at two points about what we might call being logical about logic. And he asks, you know, should we just discard logic? Uh, this is in uh, part one, uh, chapter 106. And he says, no, that would be extravagant. Why would we simply discard logic? That would be rather excessive. Um, he says, why should we? For the sake of consequentialism? He doesn't mean consequentialism the way we typically talk about it today as a set of moral theories. He means being consequential, being logical. If we're going to like discard logic, are we doing it for the sake of being logical? And he says, uh, for, the, for logic's own self. And he says, but logic as an aim in itself or as even the only means to knowledge is a different matter. Against this, one must fight even if he has against him all the authorities of thought beginning with Aristotle. So if logic is going to be viewed as something that's just, you know, a tool, you know, you could say value neutral, doesn't come with any sort of implications or obligations of its own, eh, we can take it or leave it. And that's fine. If people are going to, you know, belong to what we could call today the, you know, logic, reason, science camp, the people who are like bashing you with that and, you know, recently blowing up the correspondence theory of truth, which rightly understood doesn't cover everything, right, into something like an ideology, well, then you should push them away. You say, no, 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 we're not going to go for that. That would make sense. So we have to make a distinction within how we're using logic uh, about its, its aims. Um, he also talks about skepticism, and this is in uh, chapter 44 of part one. And he says, a school axiom, logical skepticism refutes itself since the denial of the possibility of positive knowledge is already an affirmation. And we're all familiar with these sorts of, you know, textbook dismissals, right? If you're going to assert that, you know, uh, we can't know anything, well, you're already asserting that we know that. If you're going to assert there is no truth, is that true itself, right? It's almost like that meme with the, the guy who's like, ooh, you use this. You can't possibly criticize it. Isn't that interesting, right? It's the same sort of logic uh, behind that. And Shostov says this doesn't actually convince anybody. You can do what you want because logic doesn't have the sway that we want to say. He says, in the first place, skepticism is not bound to be logical. It has no desire to gratify that dogma which raises logic to the level of law. If, if logic is going to have some validity, it's going to be based on something other than logic. And so we're going to have to investigate, well, what is that? Maybe it's going to vary from place to place. It could just be usefulness. It could be, you know, sort of a pragmatic motif for, for logic, uh, which the logicians are not going to like. And it could be just, you know, we desire to have things be that way. So, you know, the rationality of logic is based on a kind of irrationality or non-rationality of desire. So we should ask the question, then why logic? Shestov gives us several different interesting explanations, which don't have to be blown up into like the single theory of where logic came from in a genetic sense. 
One is he talks about you know, Socrates and Plato, and they're sort of just stand-ins for other philosophers in this case. We can think about people down to the present who are like this. We can even think of non-philosophers who are like this as well. And he says that Socrates and Plato tried to determine under the shifting change of appearance, the immutable, unchanging reality. The Platonic forms are an example of this. And he said, here's what their, their basic concept was. The, um, that which is real must be constant. Hence, the ideas of objects are real and the objects themselves are fictitious. And he says, the root of Platonic philosophy appears to be a fundamental defect in human reasoning, a defect regarded as the highest merit. And what is it? He says, it's difficult for a philosopher to get a good grasp of this agitated, capricious life. And so he decides that's not life at all, but a figment. Dialectics is supreme over only general concepts, and the general concepts are promoted to an ideal. And since Socrates and Plato, with a lot of variations, philosophers have been saying, well, you know, whatever is general, whatever is universal, whatever is unchanging, that's what's most real. And all this other stuff that we're experiencing and our own existential position in, in this weird thing we call life, ah, that, that's just particularity is not really that important. So that's, that's one thing that gives rise to what he's calling here dialectics. Dialectics works great with general concepts, not quite so good at the real, in our sense, stuff that we're, we're dealing with. He also talks about logic as providing a common ground for the activity of argumentation. This is in uh, chapter 45, part one. It says the Aristotelian logic, which forms the chief component in modern logic, arose, as we know, as a result of the permanent controversies, which were such sport to the Greeks. In order to argue, we have to have common ground. In other words, to agree about the rules of the game. And then he goes on and he says, in our day, dialectical tournaments, like other bouts of contention, are no longer attracting people, so logic can be relegated to the background. And there's, there's really two things to point out about this passage. So somebody might quibble and say, wait a second, Aristotelian logic, very different than modern predicate logic. And sure, that's true. You know? Although you, know, you could find antecedents in the Stoic logic as well if you want to. And the main point here is not about the particularities of the logical operations that you're working with. The main point here is about the systematization of what are going to count as rules for engaging in argumentation with each other. And there you can say, yeah, the Aristotelian logic is basically carried forward into most modern logic. I mean, there's a few exceptions here and there. Um, so that's one important point. The other important point is, is Shestoff actually right in saying, ah, people really aren't that interested in this sort of stuff? I mean, think about the... Uh, craziness involved in these debates happening in social media between people who are all worked up about you know how how important logic is and you know its extension to science mathematics all, all those sorts of stuff now people are really debating these matters um, that's why people can be so upset about what they take to be postmodernism or if it was, you know, 20 years earlier, relativism or any, any of these sorts of things. He's got a much more, you could say, metaphysically and, and uh, history of philosophy oriented discussion in uh, chapter 121 towards the end of part one. He, talk, he starts out saying A equals A, right? law of identity. They say logic doesn't need this postulate and I could easily develop it by deduction. I think not. On the contrary, in my opinion, logic could not exist without this premise. And then he says, and let me blow your mind a little bit more. It has a purely empirical origin. In the realm of fact, A is always more or less equal to A, but it could be otherwise. So what, are, what is going on when we're insisting on a thing is a thing? It can't be something different than itself, right? We're the ones insisting on that. We're the ones who are maybe even contrary to experience saying this, this has to be this way. And, and we're turning logic into a police agent that way. He says, the universe might be so constituted as to admit of the most fantastic metamorphoses. That which now equals A would successively equal B and then C and so on. At present, a stone remains long enough a stone, a plant, a plant, an animal, an animal. But it might be that a stone changed into a plant before our eyes and the plant into an animal. There is nothing unthinkable 
in such a supposition. And that's proved by the theory, of, he says, of evolution. It puts centuries in place of seconds. Now, that's not a really great argument there, but he says... Uh, anything you please may come from anything you please. A may not equal A, and consequently logic is dependent for its soundness on the empirically derived law of the unchangeableness of the external world. Uh, you know, and so there's a couple things going on here. There's kind of a Humean, you know, if we can think it otherwise, it's not absolutely necessary. And that's, that's a point that runs throughout all of Shestov's works. Logic requires a kind of necessity. It talks about itself as being the laws of thought. He's, he also brings in another thing. Admit the possibility of supernatural interference, and logic will lose that certitude and inevitability of its conclusions, which at present is so attractive to us. So he's not actually saying God exists, therefore you know, logic is, is not as uh, reliable as we think. He's saying the mere possibility of supernatural intervention, which you could rule out at the start if you want to, but that would be illogical to do that because you don't have any evidence for ruling it out, right? Uh, other than the fact that you want logic to work this way. Right? It makes things uh, more dependent. What are the problems with relying on logic over much in philosophy? He notes a number of them. One is that it leads to a kind of armchair philosophy. He talks about this in uh, chapter 13 of part two. And he's actually using that word armchair philosophy, talking about philosophy within your room where you never actually get outside and see anything else. And everything is perfectly logically consistent because you never let anything that would, would disrupt stuff in there. And therefore it becomes rather sterile and has nothing to do with life. He also talks about the habit. Now notice he doesn't say logical thinking by itself kills imagination. He says that instead, this is uh, uh, chapter 21 of uh, part one, he says that uh, the habit of logical thinking kills imagination. What does he mean by the habit of logical thinking? You're, you're always relying on logic. He says, man is convinced that the only way to truth is through logic and any departure from this way leads to error and absurdity. Now, there's a lot of things in which we probably should use logic, right? Again, he said, don't throw logic completely away. That would be extravagant. Why would you do that? That would be illogical, right? Um, and, and illogical or irrational in the broad sense. But to rely too much on logic all the time to say, well, if it can't be treated by logic, it must not exist or it must not be important or it's just sheer rationality. Well, we leave out a lot of stuff. We leave out the things that matter to us or should matter to us most. He says, the nearer we approach to the ultimate questions of existence, in our departure from logicality, the more deadly becomes the state of error we fall into. And this is him portraying the logician, saying that, and he's got this metaphor of the Ariadne ball, right? Ariadne was the daughter of Minos who gave a ball of, of twine or thread or yarn to Theseus when he had to go into the uh, Minotaur's house, the, uh, the maze. Right, the labyrinth, and he was able to find his way back out because of that after he, he kills the Minotaur. So um, he goes on and he says, the Ariadne ball has become unwound long ago, and we're at the end of the tether. We don't know. We hold the, th we hold the end of the thread f uh, firmly, and we mark time with energy on the same spot, imagining progress. We don't even realize that we ran out of thread a while back and that we might have pulled it along and we might not be able to find our way home. So he says, um, he would have been better to stay at home. Once he set out, once he decided to be a Theseus and kill the Minotaur, he should have given himself up, forfeited the old attachment and been ready to never to escape from the labyrinth. And over relying on logic kills our other capacities that would allow us to move forward. If we're always staying in our nice, safe place, uh, we're not going to move. Another big problem, logic, you know, it's useful, but there can be some pretty arbitrary conclusions because we often don't know enough to make it entirely effective. He has this great example, this is in chapter 104, of giving somebody bread, he says. A hungry man's given a piece of bread and a kind word. The kindness seemed more to him than the bread. But had he been given only the kind word and no bread, he probably would have hated nice phrases. Caution is to always be recommended in the drawing of conclusions. Right? The connections of isolated phenomena can very rarely be discerned. As a rule, several causes at once produce one effect. 
Owing to our pro propensity for idealizing, we always make prominent that cause which seems to us loftiest. So the abstraction that logic likes to, to have us engage in can lead us to, to misunderstanding what's going on and drawing the wrong conclusions. He also talks about some great thinkers who are basically <laughs> indifferent to, he says, logic and common sense. And, um, you know, what does this actually show us? Well, we'll read a little bit of this because he's got some, some, some really great uh, discussions here. He says that, uh, here we go, um, modern instances are Nietzsche and Schopenhauer both present noble examples of indifference to logic and common sense, particularly Schopenhauer, who a Kantian, even in the name of Kant, made such daring sallies against reason, driving her into confusion and, and shame, right? And so he, he, he goes on and he says that, um, uh, here we go, we've got, we've got Schopenhauer, we've got Nietzsche, um, and he says that... Uh, philosophy, there is indeed much more music than logic in the philosophy of Schopenhauer. Not for nothing is he excluded from the universities. But we can speak of him in the open. Not of his ideas, naturally, but of his, his music. The European market is glutted with ideas. How neat and nicely finished and logically well turned out those ideas are. Schopenhauer had no such goods. But what lively and splendid contradictions he boldly spreads on his stall. Often, even without suspicion, he ought to hide them from the police. The police are, of course, logic, right? And so what can we draw as a conclusion from this? Listen, there's multiple ways of doing philosophy. And if you want to do philosophy in a very strict, logical way, okay. But you know, even if you do, somebody like Schopenhauer may come along and turn that on its head. Or somebody like Nietzsche may come along. Or, or other thinkers as, as well. The last thing I'll point out is he says a deep conviction is more powerful than logical argumentation. This is in chapter uh, 27 of part two. And he's, he's often right about this. You know, we, we count on logic as if it's going to be producing its own self-evidence and its own ground. And, and Shestoff is saying, no, it can't do that. At best, it can be something that's useful from time to time for us in philosophy. But over-reliance on logic as being at the core of philosophy or as being you know, the thing that decides for all of us is actually going to keep us from philosophizing well, that is, in any way that engages with our existential condition and the lives that we're leading.